This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website. Um, just to explain uh, the way in which we are delivering this paper, uh, which uh, is really based on uh, common work and on our book, I will read out the paper and Tessa will perhaps comment on some of the pictures, uh, but then we will both take uh, questions. And uh, we are pleased, very pleased to be here and thank you for inviting us because uh, at the end of our research project, which uh, finished in September, um, this is really a very um, good opportunity for us to reflect upon uh, the contribution of our study to um, the history of the home in particular. Um, so we have put together bits and pieces from the book and trying to put everything together and, and, and uh, um, and see what what we have to say on, on this topic. Um, I think we can agree that so far health concerns have only been marginal to any explanation of how the domestic material environment changed uh, during the early modern age. Uh, work on health and home has concentrated mainly on the modern period and on spatial rather than material aspects. Hence, modernists have looked at the impact that the design of domestic space had on health, considering issues such as the position of kitchens and latrines, the number of windows, the size of rooms, and therefore the impact that the quality of indoor ventilation and sanitation had on householders. But even for the modern period, little attention has been paid to the relationship between health concerns and the appearance and dissemination, rise and decline of specific household objects. Moreover, few scholars have engaged with the perspective of the inhabitants and the active attempts to promote health through the, their consumption choices and material practices. Yet, a wide range of artifacts of daily use are referred to in early modern sources as having significance for one's health. Indeed, one striking characteristic of the core source used in our project, the numerous guides to healthy living compiled by doctors <coughs> or lay popularizers of medicines in the 16th and 17th century, and uh, we give an example here, is the attention given to the material culture of the home and its role in health maintenance. Hence, reference abound in this text to the health value of specific household objects, from bed canopies to wall hangings, from combs to leather pillows. The penetration of preventive health ideas amongst a wide audience is proven not just by the success of these cheap vernacular tracts, also called regimens, but by the appropriation of the advice they contain by many other textual genres conduct manuals for stewards or householders, educational treatises for children and students, architectural treatises, all these texts contributed greatly to disseminating um, preventive culture. One aim of our project was therefore to explore the impact that these principles of healthy living had on the transformation of the design and material culture of the Italian home in a, in a period in which, for reasons that we cannot explore in depth today, Italy was already characterized by a high level of domestic consumerism and a special attention to domestic life and the care of the body. And so there is, if you want, uh, um, a specific Italianess to the kind of developments I'm going to illustrate today. Um, um, and, and therefore, it will be interesting to see the reaction of, of British historians, but it may be that um, what we are suggesting cannot simply be generalized to other geographical areas. To what extent was the concern to build a healthy home a factor in planning a house? To what extent were specific household objects introduced and used, not simply for their aesthetic or functional value, but because of their health significance? To address these questions, we have combined the study of the above-mentioned advice literature with the evidence about healthy living practices gathered 
from a range of contemporary sources. These include visual sources, surviving museum artifacts, and then uh, a case study of Rome. Um, and here you have a, a plan of Rome at the time. Um, so we have looked at a sample of household inventories from Rome and um, at the private letters exchanged by members of patrician and noble families based in Rome and in the Papal States. We started with the assumption that the study of what was regarded as healthy and unhealthy in this period may help elucidate the role of certain objects in facilitating and even promoting preventive health practices. Um, and uh, we saw that two aspects of the way in which health hazards were conceptualized <coughs> in this period had a particular significant impact on the construction of the early modern domestic environment. First, the emergence of new definitions of bad and good air during the 16th century, and second, the growing attention paid to the vulnerability of certain organs uh, and to, to the need to protect them. So let us consider these two developments and their consequences. From the 1560s in particular, uh, we noted that definitions of good and bad air in regimens highlight a shift away from anxieties about the effects of putrid air produced by marshes, carcasses, and certain plants towards a fear of cold, damp, and windy air. One factor in this, in this shift might have been the increased familiarity in the 16th century with Hippocratic texts with their strong focus on the impact of local environmental conditions on the body. But similar concerns were also found in other areas of classical learning, which became available in Latin precisely in the 16th century, such as the works of Pliny, Ptolemy, Vitruvius, which all placed great emphasis on the relationship between air and health. The voyages of discovery, overseas trade, and the rising interest in geography also lay behind this interest in the winds, climates, um, and locality. As a result um, of this uh, enhanced awareness of environmental factors, far more attention was paid to how to locate and design a healthy home. On the one hand, architectural treatises appear to be imbued with health concerns. The crucial influence here was uh, represented by the 10 books of architecture by Vitruvius, first printed in Latin in 1486 and in Italian in the 1520s. Early in his treatise, Vitruvius clarifies that any architect, I quote, should know the science of medicine and know about climates, airs, and about which places are healthful and which disease ridden. And I quote, Consequently, substantial sections of this treatise um, are dedicated to how to choose a suitable location for one's home and how to orient it with regard to uh, the local air quality so as to best uh, preserve health. In the Renaissance, Vitruvius' advice was greatly elaborated by architect Leon Battista Alberti in his uh, treatise um, on architecture, printed in Latin in 1485 and then published in Italian in, in 1546. And throughout the following two and a half centuries, the advice imparted by Alberti was reiterated in greater detail in other architectural treatises. For example, in 1615, architect Scamozzi de devoted 60 pages of his treatise to cover more or less the same ground, but also included an updated account of the different climates and winds to be found in all the principal cities of Italy. Advice on the importance of the location of one's home for one's health was also taken up by 16th century medical writers and by manuals for heads of households. And there is much evidence that people themselves took seriously this kind of health recommendation when it came to choosing the site for their home. 
the French essayist Montaigne, who traveled to Rome in 1581, observed that the Romans were so aware of the way different areas in the city could affect their health at different times of the year, that they, I quote, changed their homes by the season, some renting, one, uh, renting out two or three palaces at great expense in order to rehouse themselves appropriately each season according to their doctor's advice. Many patrician families also solved the problem by owning one or more country villas to which they repaired in late spring and stayed until the early autumn. Indeed, villas certainly proved immensely popular with 16th century elites across Italy. The years between 1540 and 1620 were the high point of this fashion. Dozens of magnificent villas were built, for example, on the hills in Rome. Um, and, and we're just going to try and draw your attention, for example, to how, um, whereas early in, the, in about the 1510s, um, one of the first suburban villas was built down here by the river Tiber, um, by um, Kiji, uh, Agostino Kiji. Towards the end of the century, and there isn't a pointer, um, up in the top left-hand corner, um, the Villa uh, Medici was built uh, in 1570s, up on the, um, which hill is it? It's the, the hill above Piazza di Spagna. And further over, a bit to the right, on the Esquiline Hill, around the same time, 1570s, the Villa Montalto was built. Um, there are many more examples in the 70, early 17th century. The Pamphili family built their villa out here up on these hills. So they went up. Yes. The growing fashion for villegiatura and the related culture of otium, uh, that is leisure time spent withdrawing from public affairs in the country villa, inspired by classical models, were profoundly linked uh, to ideals of physical and mental healthy living. And there is evidence that the healthiness of the air was a key consideration for those who commissioned villas. Uh, before building Villa Tivoli, for example, Cardinal Ippolito d'Este had consulted his doctor as to whether the site was beneficial to his health. And we have the example of, of this particular villa. I don't know whether you have any... We were just going to say, yes, just that all the things that were included and thought about in the planning would have been um, exercise, areas for exercise and taking fresh air, certain walkways in the shade the planting schemes which would have been designed to provide um, certain kinds of scents which were beneficial to your health, fountains which were good for your um, eyes and for your, for, the, for your sense of hearing, and so on and so forth. So every element, you could argue, has a medical significance. Um, beside their quality, height was another key consideration. City dwellers were warned that basement or ground floor rooms were made unhealthy by dust in summer and by the density, heaviness and thickness of the air in winter. And this was exacerbated by the narrowest, narrowness of streets which imprisoned the damp air. One's home should therefore be relatively high up, so as to be open to the breezes and the warmth of the sun, but not so high as to be exposed to strong winds and the biting cold. Internal layout was also key to healthy living. Architects gave detailed advice on the orientation of rooms, taking into account the changing season. Hence, rooms used during the summer should face north, and those used in winter should face south. Moreover, summer rooms were higher and with more windows, uh, while those used in winter were smaller, with lower ceilings and wood panels to conserve heat. Rooms used in the evening, such as dining rooms, should face west, so they would be lit and warmed by the evening sun, while those used in the morning, such as studies and libraries, should face east to benefit from the early morning sun. These principles of climate control were widely implemented. In Genoa, it was customary for those inhabiting palaces to move to the low ceiling rooms placed on the mezzanine floor in winter. And in Rome, um, we find that unlike their predecessors, 16th century palaces now included on each floor a parallel row of rooms so that the external ones north-facing were inhabited in summer and the internal ones 
obviously south facing, were used in winter. Judging from the comments by a contemporary writing in 1612, this ability to vary one's accommodation according to the season had even entered into concerns of status and decorum. He noted that in Rome, and I quote, he who does not have various apartments on one floor with many rooms on each to change according to the season does not live decorously, and I quote. Indeed, in 1632, the head of the family we have uh, par uh, particularly started, the Spadas, had rooms for summer use facing north, a study, library, and bedroom, and a large south-facing apartment divided into four smaller rooms with the lower ceiling put in for use in winter. Her concerns, however, are a factor which has not been given due consideration by architectural historians who um, have tended to focus more on issues of status when discussing the design of these palaces. Yet these and other examples demonstrate the strong correlation between medical and architectural ideas and the impact they had on actual practice at a time when, following the ennoblement and urbanization of large sectors of the provincial elite, many were engaged in building or rebuilding their palaces and villas. Increased preoccupation about the impact of cold and damp air upon the body also contributed to explain the introduction and dissemination across the social scale of specific domestic furnishings. Fireplaces, whose popularity and prominence within Italian domestic interiors grew considerably from the late 15th century, Portable brazier, and we have an example here, um, you can see um, on the front. Um, and the most speci specialized feet warmer, re uh, represented in this engraving, uh, wall hangings and bed curtains. Um, fire, unfortunately we can't show fire, but we can show um, um, a fireplace of the time. Um, fire was understood as a primary weapon against cold air, but this was not the sole function of fireplaces. In medical discourse, their value also rested on their role in purging the air by making it mobile, dissipating it, thinning, and clarifying it, thus eliminating the damaging heavy particles in damp air. In 1581, the scholar and chronicle um, San Sovino, while praising the presence of fireplaces in Venet Venetian bedrooms, stated they had at least three healthy functions, and I quote, when one gets out of bed, the fire does not only dries out the damp, first function, that gathers while one sleeps during the night, but se second function, it, was, it warms up the room, and third function purges it of unhealthy vapors which rise in the air or otherwise, and I quote. Indeed, night air was reputed to be particularly damaging by doctors to the extent that they recommended sleeping with the windows closed even in summer. Its bad qualities were supposedly exacerbated by the exhalations rising from the stomach during the process of digestion that took, took place during sleep. So you can see how the bedroom was a particularly sensitive space for, for health due to these um, beliefs. Like fireplaces, wall hangings were seen as a key agent in the battle against dampness. And we give an example of a uh, 16th century Venetian tapestry here. They were used to draw in the dampness and thereby remove it from the air. Unadorned walls were therefore discouraged if a room was not panelled. And medical authors recommended the use of wall hangings in all seasons, made of thick wool in, in winter, especially in bedrooms, and in summer uh, made of, of, of silk. Another agent regarded as particularly effect, uh, effective against dampness was leather, probably in light of its impermeable qualities. Indeed, this material was often employed in the making of waterproof vessels such as traveling flasks. And the belief in the insulating properties of leather is confirmed by the extensive employment of this material in bedrooms. 
Here we find not only leather panels aligning the walls, and we have a, a, an example here, uh, but also leather pillows, again, surviving objects um, on the bed or day bed, leather throws to cover chests and the bed itself, and leather canopies and valance decorating the bed frames. We see the four, how the dissemination of wool, silk or leather wall hangings that became widespread in the 16th and 17th centuries was not just prompted by the increased availability of this material and by aesthetic preoccupations, her considerations also played a role in giving meaning to this new element of home consumption. These developments were also reinforced by the new emphasis in the medical advice literature on the dangerous impact of cold and damp air upon specific organs. Body extremities were now seen as particularly vulnerable, and so were the pores. Body, uh, sorry, these were understood as the road of perspiration, that is the vehicle through which the body regularly expelled superfluous waste products. This process of cell cleansing was seen as key to a healthy body, but it could be blocked if the pores were closed by freezing airs or obstructed by damp air. We can see how these understandings of the role of the pores influence contemporary explanations of the causes of illness in an account of the death of Cardinal Aldo Brandino. In February 1622, he was reported as having left Ravenna and traveled by, night, uh, by day and night for three days in an attempt to arrive in Rome for the election of the new pope. However, this reckless behavior ha has led, had led to his death, and I quote, because the cold had made his pores narrow and his blood had frozen, and I quote. Besides the pores, much anxiety surrounded the health of the head and the brain, which, being the coldest of the organs, was seen as particularly vulnerable to cold air. The importance of protecting this part of the body was emphasized in this period also by the shift from Aristotelian to Galenic views of the brain, so that this organ was no longer seen just as, as the site of memory, but as the site of the nervous system, what we would call the nervous system, presiding of emotion and sensation. Anything which lowered the temperature of the brain would create, therefore, a number of serious pathologies uh, um, affecting these vital functions. Um, the other organ that one needed to protect in particular was the stomach um, and it needed to be protected from cold air since this may disturb the vital process of digestion that took place in particular du during the night when one was asleep. And we even find specific cloths for the stomach in inventories that were presumably placed on this part during sleep, as suggested by, by medical advice. This was not an isolated case. The increased concerns about the vulnerability of certain organs encouraged the introduction and use of numerous other objects specifically designed to protect these parts of the body. This is evident in particular in the material culture of sleep and hygiene. First of all, these preoccupations account for the peculiar positioning of beds in bedrooms. Um, losing the central position beds occupy in the 15th century, and this is a 15th century image, so you see how they are central in the bedroom. Beds regularly figure in a corner of the room in the architectural plans of the following two centuries. Um, you can see that from uh, in this uh, um, drawing by Scamozzi. Um, so obviously in this way the bed is shielded from draft originating from windows and doors. Often the need to distance beds from sources of cold even led to the displacement of the fireplace from the center of the wall, which was considered the ideal in architectural theory. Um, Moreover, uh, the fact that curtains had, um, and canopies became an integral 
component of the bed frame only in the 16th century, um, as you can see in, in, uh, uh, in this picture, is evidence of a growing preference for sleeping in a hermetically closed and well-protected environment. From mid-16th century, the bed frame presents, in fact, an important new feature. It includes pillars um, supporting a canopy from which curtains are now regularly hanging, creating a space completely enclosed on all sides and also above. And you can compare these with the um, earlier representations of, of beds, um, in which uh, you, you, you can see how the curtain, even if, if it was sometimes used as an element that created privacy, uh, was not part of the bed frame, but was hanging from roads protruding from walls, as you can see. And obviously you can also see how uh, that creates only a temporary uh, kind of um, uh, privacy. Uh, also, there is no... Um, canopy, so I mean the bed is just closed on one side and there are many other arguments to do with the number of lengths uh, which increased over time um, so also different types of curtains often defined as camera room by contemporaries perhaps we can go back um, um, precisely to stress this enclosing effect um, the canopy bed had indeed become a room within a room in which the sleeper is protected not just from the cold and its damaging effects on the pores, but from light and noise, which could disturb the sleeper and the, thereby upset the stomach and the vital process of digestion. Moreover, heavy bed curtains and canopies provided a shelter, a shelter from the pernicious effects of moonlight. Being the coldest of the planets, the moon was in fact described as a dangerous element that could generate serious ailments, especially if it shone directly on the head and hence further reduced the temperature of the brain, which, as I said, was seen as the coldest of the organs. The dissemination of these health concerns offered a key a new key to understanding the changes that were taking place in the construction of the ideal environment for sleep. Certainly other elements also played a part. Historians have seen the growing culture of comfort and the rising ethos of privacy as important factors in the transformation that affected the material culture of the late Renaissance home, and the changing features of beds were certainly an aspect of these processes. Ideas of comfort, however, are not immutable. So in order for us to grasp why sleeping in what appears to us a suffocating, oppressive environment would be regarded as comfortable in the late 16th century, we need to be aware of the health benefits that our predecessors attributed to such arrangements. Preoccupation with health of the head and the pores also assigns a new role to hygiene and its material culture. We know already that the regular purging of the body was considered key to health. The superfluities from the third concoction were supposed to leave the body imperceptibly through the pores, including those of the scalp, um, but other excretions that had accumulated in the head during the night were also expelled from the mouth, nose, eyes and ears in the forms of fluids and solids. During the early modern period, fears that such superfluities might remain trapped in the body and particularly in the head where these organs concentrated grew considerably. These fears contribute to explain the importance that the morning toilet acquired in health advice uh, since it basically consisted of cleansing the various openings of the head. Inventories revealed that a range of material paraphernalia was mobilized to assist in these operations. Ear cleaners and toothpicks were transformed from rare and luxurious objects, um, jewels really, at the beginning of the period, to everyday objects for which we have no surviving examples, um, now also domestically manufactured following the instructions found in recipe books of the second half of the 16th century. Fine-toothed 
combs, um, sponges and pieces of rough cloth for the head were used to scrub the head and remove the grease and dandruff, dandruff deposited um, on the scalp um, that again blocked the pores of, of the scalp. Um, specific brushes for the moustache and for the beard also existed and were kept separate from those used for the hair, given that it was seen as unhygienic to use the same tool for facial hair and the head. And in fact, another development that we note in this period is that the superfluities clustering in the scalp and other organs of the head were increasingly described as the disgusting as, as inducing revulsion, hence the expression excrements of the head used by some authors to define these excretions and we think that that may have had uh, this um, process of differentiation of the various objects used for hygiene. The reconstruction of how our predecessors understood the physiological processes taking place within the body enables us to um, therefore, to grasp the prophylactic potential of certain household objects and hence their rise in popularity. At the same time, our approach also helps explain the demise of other objects. Um, the increased fears associated with exposing the body to um, a cold temperature are, for example, key to the disappearance of domestic artifacts and spaces associated with bathing. Uh, from the mid-16th century, we observed the disappearance of bath chambers in most palaces. And this is a recent development because in the previous decades, baths modeled on the Roman classical precedent had undergone a sort of revival in residential architecture. So-called bath all'antica, uh, meaning antique baths, if you want, inspired by the writing of classical authors and by surviving examples of ancient Roman baths, were built between the, uh, between the 1470s and the first decades of the 16th century in the residency, residencies of the ruling elite. In the next 30 years, the fashion for bath chambers became less exclusive. In Rome, it also extended to the residences of professionals, merchants, artists, and architects. By the late 16th century, however, baths were excluded from most new palaces building programs. I think we have only two examples of very small bath chambers in um, uh, Roman palaces uh, over the up to 1650. Um, parallel to the decline of this space, we witness how bathtubs and other bath accessories disappear from the domestic landscape. They are completely absent from our sample of inventories, while the 15th century, in the 15th century they could be found even in artisans' households. By 1600, lavamami washstands consisting of an iron iron or wooden tripod supporting, supporting a copper or maiolica basin and a pitcher to pour water have superseded bathtubs. Um, and unfortunately we have only the tripod, we haven't got the basin that we can imagine. Um, um, while clothes for the face or for the hands are found in place of bath towels even in houses of modest means. These new objects testify to the diffusion of daily hygienic practices that target specific parts of the upper body and replace the immersion of the full body in water. The transformation of the material culture of hygiene provides hard evidence, therefore, to confirm that a profound change in everyday hygienic practices took place in this period. This is important since this kind of intimate activities remain normally elusive as they are rarely discussed in sources. The object represents in this case the definite piece of evidence documenting a shift in practice. It, it is not simply an illustration of what we gather from textual sources, but a source in its own right. 
The medical reasons for the demise of washing by immersion can also be found in the advice literature. What makes bath risky is the view of doctors, um, in the view of doctors, is exposure to the cold, which may block the pores and prevent the regular expulsion of internal waste. Hence, while medieval regimens present baths as integral to the expedients aimed at maintaining health, early modern doctors depict taking bath not as a regular procedure, but as a practice that makes the body prone to health hazards. On the one hand, it is considered a tiring activity um, and also one that exposes the body to the dangerous change, changes of temperature and the violent impact of cold air on the wet skin. Let us note in passing that our explanations differed from, differ from the ones normally put forward in scholarly discussions of the decline in the use of bath. This decline is normally attributed to the fear that infected water or corrupted air would penetrate the body through the pores opened by the steam of the, pa of the bath, fears allegedly heightened in a period that saw repeated outbreaks of the plague and the appearance of a new infection, infectious disease, syphilis. However, we argue that this idea appears alien to early modern medical thinking, this idea of penetration of the infection through the pore. Medical authors interpret the por porosity of the skin positively, not negatively. They are preoccupied with keeping the pores open so as to avoid the blockage of impurities which must leave the body. What makes bath risky, in their view, is not the opening of the pores, but exactly the opposite, their closure determined by exposure to cold. Moreover, as we have seen, from mid-16th century, authors no longer conceptualize air as a carrier of disease, but consider it as dangerous or beneficial to health according to its temperature and level of dryness or humidity. Rather than being a result of fear, the change in hygienic customs that take shape in the second half of the 16th century is presented by contemporary lay and medical commentator as a sign of progress and social distinction. And this may explain the fact that public baths in Rome, for example, disappear later than those in noble residences. The decline in washing regularly is now depicted as an acquired freedom connected with the spread of linen underwear that efficiently collects dirt and residues emerging from the skin and spares the early modern person the risk of washing. Changing undergarments and bed linen regularly is presented as much preferable to exposing the delicate body of the gentleman to the risks posed by washing oneself and both regiments and household management texts give precise prescri uh, prescriptions about how often changing garments and bed linen should be done. The redefinition of the preferred forms of body cleansing that we have illustrated had a profound impact on the house, its organization and material culture, also beyond the examples that I, we were able to give today. It gave meaning to newly created spaces, such as dressing rooms, triggered the appearance of specific objects for the hygiene of the upper body, such as washstands, but also dressing toilets and table mirrors and of a plethora of containers for hygienic and beauty products. The diffusion of new hygienic practices stimulated the domestic as well as the commercial production of soaps, toothpaste, scented waters, and other products for skin and hair care, and led to an extraordinary rise in the popularity of linen underwear. It also multiplied the need for body services, a very important aspect boosting the number of domestic servants employed in affluent houses in the service of the person. Our study thus reveals the forgotten role of medicine in shaping domestic material culture and suggests that the health perspective should be considered along the main interpretive paradigms that have framed the narrative of change in the home environment, 
that is issues of emulation and display of status, political and religious change, gender hierarchies, economic and market logics, the availability of new materials and the spread of new fashions, and the allegedly growing quest for privacy and comfort. Moreover, the examples examined today show that the health purpose of domestic objects was not fixed and static. It mirrored changing ideas of what contemporaries regarded as major threats to health. And though, although early modern medical historians have presented preventive medicine as a body of knowledge unchanged since classical times, we have suggested that ideas of health hazards transformed considerably over the 100 year period considered in our study. Under the pressure of broader cultural influences and changing social circumstances, health concerns swung away from corrupt air to the threat of cold, damp air. Increased emphasis was placed on the danger presented by waste products blocked inside the body. This was coupled with the growing disgust surrounding waste products expelled from the body and the new stress of the vulnerability of certain organs. The awareness of the dynamic character of physiological ideas is therefore indispensable if we wish to recover the health significance of a wide range of domestic objects.